played me, he's more determined than ever to play next year. Carbon, you're in. There's Hudson in the hand of the The Footscray Football Club is in serious financial trouble. Technically insolvent, its projected loss for 1989 is almost $800,000, following on from a 1988 loss of almost half a million. The club's accumulated debt is fast climbing towards $2 million, and with the Bulldogs' proposed rescue package being negotiated with the Footscray City Council, viewed by the VFL as nothing more than a short-term band-aid solution, the league has come to the conclusion that the doggies' time is up. VFL Chiefs have been unsuccessfully endeavouring to engineer a merger between two struggling Melbourne-based clubs for four years. The Bulldogs simply can't meet their financial obligations. Finally, the VFL has a merger scenario that can be actively pushed through. Footscray President Nick Collum has been empowered by his board to listen to merger offers and has attended a series of meetings with Fitzroy President Leon Wegard and league officials, where various possible merger scenarios have been tossed around. To this day, both Colum and Wegard maintain that no formal proposal was ever presented or agreed to at these preliminary discussions held prior to the October 3 meeting at VFL House. But Footscray CEO Dennis Gallimberti has reason to believe otherwise and spent the previous night contacting media outlets all over Melbourne, revealing that a merger between Fitzroy and Footscray is about to be pushed through. Die-hard Bulldog fans are beside themselves at the unfathomable prospect that their beloved club is about to be voted out of existence. The proposed joint venture heavily skewed in Fitzroy's favour, appearing to be more of a takeover than a merger. I got a couple of late night phone calls after I got home then and got up and, uh, and did breakfast the next morning on the Fox and I just let fly. I was very emotional about it, um, very upset, um, angry, um, bitter, every emotion you could think of I had that morning and I just let the AFL have it. I just said it was wrong and it was. I took phone calls and did all that stuff. And then I got off here at nine o'clock and Tony Peake, the communications manager at the time, then uh, phoned me and said, what's your home address because I want to send this to you. And this is the, uh, the background of the Fitzroy Bulldogs and, uh, and all the things that were uh, involved in terms of how much debt there was and what was going to happen and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm amazed I've still got it because I should have thrown it on the fire. One of the great works of fiction. They can't do this to a club, you know, not to us. And um, I thought about it all night, you know, and then I just thought next morning, woke Mum and Dad up early and I said, you know, the only way to beat them is get on the radio. The, you know, the media kills you or it can make you, so let's... Let's get support out there. And um, I got on, which was really fortunate, uh, 3AW said that I could go on at 8.30 and call for supporters to go down to the club and, and rally for support. Around about 11 o'clock, everyone was milling at the, uh, the ground. I mean, there was probably around about six or 700 supporters there just crying and, um, and they're just like lost chooks. Someone said, um, let's all go to march on VFL House and all that sort of stuff, you know, and show our anger. And I said, hang on. I said, look, you've got the media right here now. You know, there's a, an opportunity for you to, to you know, the vent, the, the pain and that, that and the grief. So I just started spruiking and I said, this is social vandalism. The, the silver tails are coming to the dark of the night and absconded with our footy club. Meanwhile, the Footscray board are filing into VFL House. Are they, as the newspapers proclaim, dead men walking? Unbeknownst to Bulldog board members, the football media or the general public to this very day, the entire Fitzroy board has also been summoned to league headquarters. The Lions have agreed in principle to progressing merger discussions should the Footscray board unanimously support the venture. Ushered secretly into a side room, they're given strict instructions to remain out of sight. We hadn't visited all the points that would be of uh, interest to the Footscray people or the Fitzroy people. So I, I, that's why I'm tending to agree with, um, with Nick that we hadn't, we hadn't gone right down the track of formalising anything. We were determined not to do anything until the whole Footscray board had put their hand up and said, yes, we can't go on. Then that would have been the starting point for what you call the deal. We would have then started talking about the deal because we had them... Um, going out of business and Fitzroy offering them a partnership in an ongoing football club. So uh, whoever conjured up the, the two meetings happening at once must have known that they were very close. To well, I think that Ross Oakley had a mandate to uh, rationalise the competition and Ross Oakley was determined to reduce the number of 
Melbourne-based clubs, and he saw Footscray as a soft target. The tension in the VFL boardroom is palpable as VFL Commission Chairman Ross Oakley commences his presentation. He laid it on the line. Gentlemen, this is where we're at. You have these problems, and he read out the problems that the club had that were mainly financial. We at the VFL have several options. The options include taking your licence away, and he was very specific about that. So this is what we're proposing for you. This is what we're putting on the table to you. Take it or leave it. There'd been some discussions between uh, the two boards and we brought the two boards together and we put the deal together. So we had to be the mediator. We had to bring them both closer together and, uh, and that's the role we played. Oakley strongly reinforces the fact that as directors of the club, the individuals around the table, along with other high profile supporters such as Charlie Sutton, who have provided individual guarantees, will be held personally liable for the Bulldogs' outstanding debts and may have their private assets seized to meet the repayments. The proposal sitting on the table in front of them clearly outlines two options and two options only, extinction or merger. If they refuse to sign the merger document, the club's licence will be revoked and an administrator appointed that very afternoon. One board member, Bob Moody, suffers a heart murmur and fears he's going to collapse as the pressure begins to take its toll. The Commission left. Um, we sat around for quite some time, at least an hour, maybe two, discussing all of the options and what we should do. There was a lot of passion a lot of people who didn't want the merge. I didn't want the merge. I would have done anything. What do we do, gentlemen? Ba debate went round and round and round the table. And finally, it was put that we vote on whether we will accept to merge or not accept to merge. And before we did that, I made it very plain that if it wasn't unanimous, there would be no decision. But remembering that if we did that, the threat was that we would have our licence revoked. We weren't in a position where we, we could consult anybody. We were, we were sitting around a table with a gun pointed at our head. No one would have liked to be in the position that Nick Collin was in um, in 1989, uh, prior to the fight back. I don't think that anyone who was in the position that he was in could have pulled any kind of rabbit out of the hat like the fight back was. One may uh, quibble with some of the decisions that he took, but yeah, he'd been dealt a pretty bad hand at that point. I think at the end, the gun that was at our head, to our shame, to our shame, I think convinced us that we should accept what was being put to us. I don't think we had... We neither were given nor sought the opportunity, and I think we were wrong. We should have sought the opportunity, but I don't think we'd have been given it. That's the way it went. The board, the board voted for it. Um, eventually, I signed the document. Now, you know, it's interesting. Had the document not been signed, then the ensuing court proceedings couldn't have occurred. It was the fact that we were forced to sign a document in the fashion that we were forced to sign the document. By pushing us into that corner, holding the gun at our head, the VFL misread it and they shot themselves in the foot. Well, if the AFL and the AFL lawyers had done their job properly, we probably would have never had the opportunity to overturn the merger because if on that Tuesday at VFL House, where the Footscray board members met, if there had been a resolution passed that the Footscray Football Club surrender its licence, full stop, if that motion had have been carried, that would have been the end of the club that day. But that motion was never put. Um, so fortunately, um, that meant that the licence was still alive and had never been surrendered. The jubilant VFL commissioners now head next door to attend to the formality of receiving the Fitzroy Board's endorsement of the merger proposal. I hope that most of the people were a bit surprised at the um, elation of a couple of the um, directors. The press conference was going to be cancelled if nothing happened next door. And that's why they did the Irish jig when they came in and said everything's in place. Bang, announcement. Fitzroy agreed in principle. They, they were very like-minded um, to my original thought. They, 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 they had similar ideas to what I initially 
articulated to Ross that, yes, we'd be in it because that would be our future, pay all the debts off, $3 million in the bank, um, get the best of the two lists, you know, and it'd be just a wonderful football team. We didn't have a deal in place. So what we had is a concept in place that we all agreed with. And we had Footscray who were out of business. So, and we were the only bidder to bring whatever was left of Footscray along with Fitzroy to make a merged team. Fitzroy's constitution dictates that the club will have to take the merger to its members for ratification. But given the Lions' own perpetually parlous financial state, this is seen to be a mere formality. The media are called in for the historic announcement, as an up-and-coming young Channel 10 journalist by the name of Eddie Maguire reports. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the VFL Commission and the boards of the Fitzroy and Footscray Football Clubs are very pleased to announce today the, the formation of a new force in VFL football called the Fitzroy Bulldogs. After three and a half hours of meetings today, the Fitzroy and Footscray football clubs are no more. In like, um, if you were extremely ill and someone said you need a heart transplant, you don't really want it, but uh, you accept the heart because while it's not your heart beating in there, you're still alive. The first time in many, many years they're going to have a winning chance, I would think. And as far as the Footscray supporters are concerned, we're going to try and uh, have as much influence in the western suburbs as we can. The VFL told us today that it was the finish. The Fitzroy Bulldogs will play at Prince's Park, train at the Western Oval, select a combined team. The board of directors will consist of four from each club. Fitzroy President Leon Wigard will be chairman. The chief executive will be Max Kelleher, the former Fitzroy chief executive. Their jumper will be the Fitzroy colours but with a new format. However, the insignia will be the Bulldog. More like a Fitzroy takeover than a merger. Under the agreement, the VFL will pay out the debts of both clubs, while the Fitzroy Bulldogs will be able to exceed their salary cap of $1.4 million. The VFL say Footscray would have been extinct because of an accumulated loss of $2 million. More than half of the players will go. There are 125 available, 58 to be selected, 67 to go into the internal draft. The 13-team competition means a buy will occur each week and paves the way for a South Australian team to enter the competition in 1991. After more than a century as the heartbeat of Melbourne's western suburbs, the Footscray Football Club is dead. But in rubber stamping the death notice, President Nick Collum has inadvertently signed the Bulldogs' stay of execution. A remarkable twist of fate that will not reveal itself until later in the week. The first stone has been cast in the greatest David and Goliath battle this game has ever seen. The seeds of Footscray's fight back have been sown and they're about to take root. The fight back begins. That's next on Headliners. There was not even a second thought because it was my club I was fighting for, so heck, you just go for it. Welcome back to Headliners. It's the afternoon of Tuesday, October 3, 1989, and VFL Chief Ross Oakley has just announced the merger of the Fitzroy and Footscray football clubs. Although to devastated Bulldog fans, it sounds far more like a takeover than it does a merger. Football fans of all denominations are stunned as the unthinkable suddenly becomes reality. Mergers have been a threat hanging over the competition for years, but no one can quite believe that one has finally materialised. Ken Oliver, son of Bulldog legend Arthur, storms into the Footscray Social Club and removes his father's portrait from the wall. Victorian Minister for Sport, former Geelong great Neil Tresize, urges the club to seriously consider returning to the VFA competition rather than disappearing off the face of the football earth altogether. If ever a football club needs those who love it, it's the Footscray Football Club right now. They had a gun put to their head, and I knew that if I was in that position, I might have reacted exactly the same. But, having said all that, this was the football club I loved, and that thousands of people loved, and they weren't going to take it away and, and merge it, and, and just make it disappear. Yeah, it was gutted, like we, we had no say in it at all. You wake up one morning, and there it is, we're gone. I mean, what do you do? It's like you lose your soul in a way, because that's what you live and breathe, your football, your football club. You go every weekend, you stand in the same spot. And it was just devastating for the people. That, to me, was the first real example I'd had of, of how football could fracture friendships. I mean, it, the emotion that, uh, that spilled over at the time was amazing. I've never seen a city react like it. 
Um, they realised that Footscray were being dudded here, dudded badly, by the league. No doubt in the wide world about it. The supporters have to, have to feel like they've got their say. Now, in this process, they really didn't have a say. They weren't given the opportunity to have a say. Because right up until that Tuesday, I stress, we were not talking merger seriously. We were talking merger investigation very seriously, but we were not talking merger. The apathy of the supporters, the lack of marketing, the lack of support by industry in the West, the lack of support commercially, financially, in any other way of the wealthy so-called supporters of Footscray, all that apathy together amounted to absolutely nothing for the Footscray Football Club. We used to go around cap and hand all the factories and there was thousands of them around there and they'd, you know, they may give you $100 but they wouldn't do much. But to the ordinary supporter, the people who lived off Geelong Road and all those areas there, it was just the, uh, you know, their, their reason for living. The Footscray Football Club was at a very low ebb and it needed the jab up the arse to get it off its backside, to get it to stand up for itself. And it was, it was this whole merger thing. It backfired big time on the VFL. It was a huge backfire. A lot of people were pretty shuddered about the whole situation. And uh, I mean, not just the players, but I think that the ones that really were hurt were the supporters who loved the club and been their life. Just some of those die-hard, passionate, you know, the ones that spirit, you look in their eyes, you see the red, white and blue with their scarf and their beanies, who just love the club. And you could see, you could just see that really hurting in them. And that really even made us as players hurt even more. And I remember as a group of players, we met uh, that next week at the social club. Uh, one night it was, we obviously had a meeting at the club to discuss the merger and what our, our futures were gonna be. Nearly every one of us had a beer in our hand, just saying, well, this is it. I knew what was in the hearts of the people of the Western suburbs, and I knew they wouldn't let it go easily. So I was comforted by the fact that there would be an uprising and that there was a reform committee waiting in the wings to take over. Wednesday night at the Footscray Social Club, which has become a home away from home for lost Bulldog fans refusing to accept their fate. Peter Gordon, the feisty local lawyer behind the previous year's Save the Dogs campaign, which had successfully lobbied the club to remain at the Western Oval, arrives at the club around 9.30, having been away on a court case since the bombshell first dropped. As soon as we, he came in the door of the social club, uh, the first thing we basically said to him was, well, what are we going to do? And um, he said, uh, the first thing he said is, we've got to go to court. So it wasn't as if we devised a strategy that night. Uh, on the basis of what he knew uh, as to what had tra transpired over the last two or three days, he basically said, without knowing any more and without looking at the legal position, he said, we've got to go to court. Have we got a plaintiff? Um, and the first plaintiff we thought we had was a woman called Carol Liddell, um, who was a member of the Bulldog co connection. And uh, she was keen up to a point and then uh, was worried that if she lost the case, the, uh, the VFL would pursue her for costs and bankrupt her and throw her out of her home. And that was a legitimate concern. And sitting over by a table at the bar was Irene Chatfield. It's the first time I'd actually met Dennis Gallenberti. And uh, there was Stephen Palmer there, and he said, um, what you're going to have to do is just meet us at Peter Gordon's in the morning, Slater and Gordon's in Footscray, and we'll just sign some papers and, you know, we'll protest against the, uh, them taking over, the VFL and uh, Fitzroy taking over. And I said, OK, that's fine. I didn't want to go to court, but we had to. You know, I mean, it's your club. And if you think you've got a chance to win, you go for it. For a merger to be enacted, uh, it needs the consent of 75% of the members. So that was the biggest loophole. The second loophole was that we believed that an administrator under corporations law had been appointed and the licence agreement at that point said that before an administrator is appointed or before an administrator can act, 
he's got to investigate and examine the affairs of the company for 28 days and, and then has to report to the members at the end of that 28 day period. So those two things hadn't happened. They didn't say, um, oh, you're going to lose your possessions and all that sort of stuff. But when we were sitting in court next day, I must have looked pretty nervy, I reckon. And the next minute, all these fellas are rushing over in their little suits and uh, they said, oh, you have to sign this, you know. And I said, what was it? And it was to say that if you lost, you'd be liable for it. And I said, does that mean what I got? And they go, yeah. I said, oh, well, what the hell? I've got the car, my life insurance, I've got everything I own. It doesn't worry to me, you know, I'll just do it again. So I just signed the paper. There was just, there was not even a second thought because it was my club I was fighting for. So, heck, you just go for it. The Victorian Supreme Court hears the case of Irene Chatfield versus the VFL. The league arguing that the Footscray Football Club has actually surrendered its licence, thereby eliminating requirements that members be consulted and the club given a month before action can be taken. But, as Dennis Gallimberti quite rightly mentioned earlier, no such motion to formally surrender the licence was ever passed at the fateful Footscray board meeting on Tuesday morning. By day two of the case, Friday, October the 6th, 1989, the VFL are forced to concede this critical point to Bulldog barrister Tim Ganane. The VFL's barrister had said to him, um, you made this application, God knows what you've got in mind, you know, you're in debt, you can't get out of it, but what we're going to do is we're going to give you time to raise these funds. His precise words were, we're going to give you just enough rope so you can hang yourselves. Um, so what we're going to do is just adjourn it for 21 days. The Footscray Football Club has just been brought back from the dead. A faint pulse revived in the form of a 19-day deadline to raise a whopping $1.5 million and keep it alive. It's widely regarded as a long shot at best. Peter Gordon and his unofficial rescue team have no staff, no money and no plan. But they do have the most precious commodity any football club can lay claim to, hope. So when I was told that, it just clicked with me that the opportunity for a 21-day campaign with the threat of the noose hanging over us was a huge PR opportunity. And I recall saying to Tim on the phone, without even thinking about it, Tim, you just kicked the winning goal. Well, they thought they were giving us enough rope to hang ourselves because they thought that there was no way known we'd ever be able to raise enough money to clear the debt and that we'd, at the end of the 19 days we'd still be insolvent and therefore the court wouldn't entertain our application. But, um, of course, they uh, underestimated the resolve and the courage of um, the Footscray Football Club supporters and the wider football community. I came out of court there and I just knew we had the confidence. But confidence, hope and resolve don't pay the bills. I said, we've got no hope of doing that. I said, we're gone. There's no way known us as the Bulldogs or, or, or the footy club or our supporters in general can raise that sort of money. We've got no hope. I was cynical about it. I thought there'd be the almost knee-jerk reaction of people saying, we can't have this, and they'd wave the flags and make a lot of noise, and then it would all go away. It's time for the little man to stand up and be counted. Who really owns our game? The common man or the corporate machine? 19 days, $1.5 million, the clock is ticking. It's a daunting figure in the tough economic times of 1989, but if the Footscray Football Club is to survive into 1990, it will take the greatest community-based logistical performance in football history. The odds are, once again, heavily stacked against the battlers of the western suburbs. As English literary critic John Churton Collins once put it, in prosperity, our friends know us. In adversity, we know our friends. The inspirational conclusion to Footscray's fight for survival, when we return next time on Headliners. I remember th thinking to myself and saying to Dennis, We've got 21 days and we need to use it. And, and what we're going to, week one, we're going to do this rally. Week two, we're going to do this, call it, we're going to have someone at every intersection in, in Victoria if we can. Uh, week three, we're going to do a concert. In the meantime, let's try and schedule whatever we can so we use the entire three weeks. And we knew that the work was in front of us. 19 days, $1.5 million. There's no time for Peter Gordon, Dennis Gallimberti and his small team of true believers to celebrate the slender lifeline they've been granted. If they are to defy the odds in these tough economic times, they need to quickly and effectively harness the latent passion for the Footscray Football Club that they believe to exist right throughout Melbourne's western suburbs. 
The key to galvanising the West will be a fight-back rally to be held at the Western Oval on Sunday morning, less than 48 hours away. The clock is ticking. We immediately went back to the offices of Slater and Gordon in Footscray and we set about forming a, a board in exile um, to administer the club, uh, outside the club if you like, to uh, organise and administer the campaign because at that point we weren't allowed to, um, we weren't al allowed access to the club or its records. I felt that the, the key component to it was to project on the, on the Sunday morning, not just a sense of outrage but a sense of we reject all that and we are going on and we've got a plan and here are the elements to it and all it needs is you. And I thought the elements of that plan were firstly to have a board, secondly to have a coach and to be honest with you I didn't really care who it was. <laughs> I just wanted to be able to announce we had a coach um, that morning. The preference was Terry Wheeler because um, he had um, he'd been reserves coach and he was a Footscray boy and you know, much loved by the um, by the faithful and knew the players. You know, I think I said to him, um, here's what we're doing um, and we're going to raise this money and we think if we do that we'll have a team for next year and we'd like you to coach the, coach the club. The third element of Peter Gordon's master plan is the players, who are as confused and concerned about their immediate futures as anyone. The Fitzroy Bulldogs will sign a total of 58 players from the combined Fitzroy and Footscray lists, with the 67 leftovers to end up at the Brisbane Bears or take their chances in the national draft. I do recall very clearly going to meet with EJ and Charlie. Uh, it was in the uh, old um, past players room and there was a big poster of EJ and Charlie with the 54 flag behind them as they were speaking to us and I was look, kept looking at it and it really hit home that the fact that hey, we were gone. We were certainly gone. We were, it was all over. Bulldogs were gone. No more. And that would have been a tough thing, losing those guys who were your mates to go and play wherever they have to play. The VFL turned some of the players against us. It was crucial, we thought, to have a list of players at the rally on Sunday the 8th of October. And we mustered a good 25 to 30 players that day. But the VFL got to certain players not to go. We were told to keep, uh, keep a low profile, um, not to get too heavily involved in the whole razzmatazz of the uh, Save the Bulldogs type of thing. They got their media unit to start conditioning the press to put out stories that our campaign was hopeless. So they did their best to dampen any hope we had to get a large number of people to that rally at the Western Oval. Front page of the Sunday Age is a letter to me <laughs> from Ross Oakley saying, uh, bear in mind, you don't have to just raise uh, 1.5 million dollars you've got to raise five million dollars and unless you can guarantee us you can do that and show us a three-year cash flow that um, uh, then you're in trouble sunday october 8 1989 d-day for the footscray fightback campaign with a revival rally scheduled for 10 a.m at the western oval a big turnout will spread belief and hope throughout the western suburbs but a small showing will effectively end the resistance once and for all as I was driving to the ground, there were media reports in, in, on various media outlets that there was nobody at the ground, that the, uh, the campaign was hopeless, there was no point going there because it couldn't possibly achieve anything. And I remember being over there and, uh, and there was Peter Gordon, there was Dennis Gallenberti and there was Alan Dalton who wrote the book Too Tough to Die. And there was around about 50 people there who thought, oh, well, we've lost it. The day was grey, the morning was grey. I got there about 10 to 10. Set up in the stand, there was about two or three hundred people. I thought, oh my God, we're gone. And then all of a sudden, people come from everywhere. I think they sort of just realise, you know, that um, if they don't make it to the club, they don't donate, we're gone. Today was the day they were going to stand up and be counted. Even at about 10 o'clock, it didn't look like that big a crowd, you know. Um, but um, as it got going, I remember thinking to myself like a minute in, into the speech, where are those people come from? And it was just, it was big. There have been various estimates as to how big it was, but boy, oh boy, it was big. And I'd announced, please welcome onto the Western Oval the Footscray Football Club team for 1990. And as they started walking out of the race, the wall of sound that came from those people who had just packed one half of the Western Oval was just extraordinary. Despite suggestions to the contrary from the powers that be, 25 senior Footscray players march out to show their support. Peter Gordon whips the crowd into a frenzy with an intentionally provocative statement. This may be the last time you see a Footscray team assembled on the Western Oval. It's up to you.
It was like a hero welcome. You know, you walked in, they were all cheering you, and um, it really was emotional. It really was emotional. It just really, once again, it hit home how much that the, not just the Footscray Footy Club, Western Suburbs, people wanted their footy club. They were so passionate about keeping their own club, and, uh, geez, that was, that was very emotional. Um, Emotional time it was, yeah. It was like a physical thing. It was just an amazing volume and, and power of emotion. It was an extraordinary thing. Went on for minutes. His background was perfect. He was a Western Suburban boy. He loved the footy club. Uh, he's the, 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 the battling boy made good. All those things, all the ingredients were just so typified, so typified the Bulldogs and that Bulldog spirit, and he milked it for whatever. And when I say milked it, I don't mean in a nasty way, but he, he tapped into it. He knew the nerves to touch, and he and he got to immobilise the uh, the doggies and probably a large part of the footy community, and said, "We're not going away." Think of how you feel um, when you wake up the first round next year, and every all of your mates' teams are playing that day, but yours isn't, and will never do so again. Think of how you'll feel about that. You know, there's the players over there. If you want them to be out here in six months' time, then you've got to give and you've got to give and you've got to keep on giving. It was like a big wave of emotion just washed over you as you got up there and talked, and everybody just rallied the money that was flying around the joint at that stage. I'd never seen money like that at Footscray. <laughs> Nobody had. I have kids, and I, and I wanted my kids to, to barrack for this football club. Um, and that the footy club had meant a lot to me for a number of years. Um, I, have, I have lifelong friends that I made at that club. And for, to, to, for me to, to see the Peter Fosters and Doug Hawkins of the world uh, and they weren't going to play for that footy club. And they were balling. In fact, we are all balling. It turned out to be speech after speech after speech and the sun came out and everything just, you know, it was like the wind changing direction in the last quarter. Everything kind of um, turned our way and people gave great speeches. The most um, inspirational speaker was Peter Gordon because uh, he laid out the plan and he laid out the reasons why we should stand up and fight for the club. He explained that you know, it would be easy for us to lay down and let the club go, but it needed a lot of courage and a lot of fight to turn the situation around and that this was a time when we all had to stand up and fight. I remember that day, as I said, arriving at the ground with, with absolutely no hope and walking into the ground and suddenly there was hope. I wore my life members badge and uh, uh, as I spoke I, I just looked at it and I touched it and I said uh, I always wanted to be a life member of, of, of Footscray and I said and I don't want to be a life member of nothing. Um, yeah, very special times. We all know how fierce the rivalry is on match day between, certainly between the, the, uh, the 12 Victorian clubs but when you attack one of them, it was like, it always reminded me of the big Irish family. It's okay to fight amongst yourselves when you're Irish, but if anyone comes from the outside and tries to change the dynamics, then the whole 12 unite and they turn on the, uh, the intruder. I think the issue became bigger than Footscray, it became a football issue, and people from other clubs realised, well, this is going to happen to our club. The Richmond cheer squad were there in, in droves on, on that particular day. They, they did a terrific effort. You know, they raised a lot of money for us. Um, I think St Kilda was there too. There were a number of the supporter groups and, and the cheer squads that, that, that got involved. When I saw the number of people who were there and the level of anger amongst the crowd, I knew from that point, and we hadn't raised a cent yet, I knew from that point onwards that the campaign was successful. People turned up expecting to voice a bit of rage and despair that their football team had gone and they left thinking we can, we can and we have turned this around. I was surprised at the level of money we raised that day. Look, there were a lot of emotional scenes and you know, there, were, there were grown people crying and, um, but there were a lot of people who had a, a very fierce resolve and a look in their eye that you could tell that they weren't prepared to allow the VFL um, to, um, to, run, to run over the top of them. I've always been proud, but it, yeah, I, I think that day uh, I've never been prouder of the members and, and, and maybe I've never been as in touch with the members as I was on that day. You don't appreciate what supporters do, what supporters feel and, and what supporters go through for their club. You know, it was an incredible awakening and yeah, I was enormously proud of them that day. The rally was really a watershed. I mean, I think people tended to forget about Fitzroy after, after the rally and focus on um, what, what we could achieve. It was a real privilege to be part of it and I doubt that I or any of the people who 
uh, were there or played a significant role in it, we'll ever see the like of it again. More than 10,000 people have voted with their feet and hearts. The Footscray fight back is well and truly alive. The Footscray Football Club has gone from being dead and buried to raising almost a third of their financial target, an incredible $450,000 in one unforgettable day at the Western Oval. There's still plenty of life in the old dogs yet, but with more than a million dollars still to be found, it will take a mass community effort from the entire Western suburbs, the likes of which have never been seen. The fight back continues. That's next on Headliners. We didn't have anywhere to put it and we ended up putting it in a, um, in a police cell. <laughs> and um, we had to go to the police and ask them for the use of the police cell. And from memory, they didn't have a key to the cell or they, um, they couldn't secure it. And uh, the money was left overnight in a cell which was basically with the door ajar. Last week on The Gospel... Now, the bike shorts, they say... It's going to be skin colour. It's going to be skin colour. What would Brad Hardy wear? Flaming <laughs> <laughs> red one. <laughs> That's The Gospel on Fox Footy Channel. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superman Returns tumblers are now landing at Hungry Jack's. Purchase any value meal, and then for $2.50, you'll receive a Superman Returns collectible 3D tumbler. Collect all four, and leap into Hungry Jack's now. It's 1970, Blues versus Pies. Alex Cheselenko. Alex Cheselenko! Cheselenko! <laughs> Can you, Jesse, you stand here. I'll be Mackay. Dave, you can be uh, Jerker Jenkins. <laughs> Little bit of leverage for Jesse Linko. You'll be all day. Takes it to the wing position. Oh, Jesse! Jesse! Oh! Oh! You'll be all day! Yeah! Oi. Yes! Nice grab. <laughs> and Reese Shaw, awkward half volley. Brilliant! A brilliant goal! One touch opening. A vibrant screen. 1.3 megapixel camera. Bluetooth connectivity. And a music player that fit your lifestyle as perfectly as it fits your hand. The new Nokia 6131. Fits you. Nokia. Connecting people. New in Harley Norman's Games Hotspot. Are you ready to play? The huge first-person shooter game is coming to PC and Xbox 360. An amazing game that turns your world upside down, literally. Walk on walls and ceilings, run through portals, and even leave your body behind in the all-consuming pursuit of revenge. It's time to play. Only on PC and Xbox 360. Now at Harley Norman's Games Hotspot. Winners. Fab gets the kick away. Losers. That's about as bad as it gets. And everything in between. Oh, what a beauty. Oh. He's getting out. The winners. 7.30 Sunday night on Fox Footy Channel. Welcome back to Headliners. It's October 1989 and the Footscray Football Club is fighting for its life. With $50,000 in coterie pledges, along with $400,000 cash carted across the road in a wheelie bin from Slater and Gordon to be deposited in the Commonwealth Bank, the first blow in the Footscray fight back has been a telling one. Peter Gordon and his board in exile now turn to a mass community fundraising drive hitting the streets of Melbourne in pursuit of a further $1 million. There were just people coming from everywhere doing in incredible things. You know, Seth Sargent, who was you know, running the, the entire bulldog merchandising operation from his second-hand ute. The drill hall out at Footscray, near the ground, became a, a sort of a hive of activity where every Footscray barracker came in and gave something. And there were, there were collectors everywhere. It's like Children's Hospital Appeal. It was just that big. They were collecting everywhere. There were people who really had uh, not remotely the physical capacity to do it, walking the streets knocking on doors day after day after day. There were people answering the door 
who were in very straitened financial circumstances themselves, unemployed people, pensioners, disabled people, giving away far more money than they responsibly should have. But there was no other way the club was going to be saved. It was not going to be saved out of the uh, pockets of government or big corporations. It was going to be saved by the ordinary people who lived in the, in the western suburbs, and so that kind of pain was was necessary. It took me two years to catch up on my Medibank, you know, because we put money in, but you just put in. It didn't matter how far you were behind on other accounts, who cares, as long as your club was going to be there. To be able to organise a campaign of that size in such a short time, it's just incredible. And how they did it, I still don't know, but the volunteers came forward, um, they door knocked, they went on every street intersection, they come back day after day. It was just an amazing community effort. Kids were opening their, their cans on the corners and opening their, their piggy box to give their couple of dollars, you know, to keep the Bulldogs alive. It really was an amazing effort by not just the Western Suburbs, I think football people in general. They just got behind us. Melbourne's West is awash with emotion, and there are simply too many stories to share all of them with you here. The Fight Back book, Too Tough to Die, shares remarkable tales such as the old digger in his late 80s who canvasses support from every shop along Williamstown and Somerville Roads, limping along slowly and painfully on his walking stick. The touching story of a man in his 90s, no longer able to speak because of a stroke suffered years earlier. When shown newspaper clippings screaming death of the bulldogs, tears slide silently down his cheeks. His son says it's the first time he's ever seen his father cry. A couple of volunteers knock on the door of a West Footscray flat. The door opened by a man and woman in the process of packing possessions. Their mother has just died. The collectors apologise and begin to leave, only to have $100 slipped into their tin. Mum loved the Bulldogs and we know she would have wanted this. A European-born woman has lived in the western suburbs since arriving in Australia as a World War II refugee. Sharing in the remarkable camaraderie of the drill hall gang, she tells her newfound friends that it's the first time in more than 40 years that she truly feels like she belongs. Likewise, the West's previously disenfranchised Vietnamese community, who know little, if anything, about VFL football, but recognise the significance of saving their club. It was a mass movement of people who were willing to put aside you know, individual differences, individual financial trouble, time, and just and just pitch in and it would not have happened it absolutely would not have happened um, unless very large numbers of people were prepared to do extraordinary things which they did over a three or four week period well, they just sang that song over and over and over again and uh, the tins just kept jingling along that's that's football in the raw and that's what it's all about there were people in that drill hall who um, who were there 16 17 hours a day they had all become good friends and good mates and, and a lot of the, the bonds and the friendships that were formed then persist uh, to this day. Likewise, you know, the board that formed um, uh, at that time, you know, with people like, like Mike Fian and, and Adrian Fitzpatrick and Peter Welsh and, and myself, essentially stayed together for the, for the next seven years. Every conceivable means of raising funds is called upon. The drill hall becomes the epicentre of a network of raffles, jumble sales, trash and treasure markets, lamington drives and, of course, the tin rattling campaign. 500 tins had gone out initially, with early estimates hoping for a $50,000 return. But as volunteers begin returning with full tins, only to get them empty before heading out again, organisers begin to appreciate that they are onto something far more special. A woman with two artificial legs hobbles into the drill hall on crutches, insisting she takes part in the efforts. Off she heads with a collection tin strung around her neck, returning hours later with it filled to the brim. Sure enough, she empties it, hobbles back out the door and returns a few hours later with another full tin. Day one of the door knock raises $110,000, with a further $80,000 collected on day two. With tins still trickling in throughout the days to follow, the Fight Bank bank account has swollen to $800,000. With a Legends game at Skinner Reserve between former Footscray and Collingwood greats set to raise a further $75,000, the positive momentum of the Fight Back campaign is near irresistible. And all of a sudden it became this, this whole new animal with its own energy and it became politically right to be involved. It was a, a socio-political 
change in the stance of the club. And it was terrific, because people all of a sudden were motivated and people were passionate. We had a positive brand, as the, as the marketers say, and people wanted to be associated with us and there were offerings of support coming from people that had never contacted us before. We were struggling to sort of, you know, with sponsors and all of a sudden people are putting in 50,000 and all this and like, we would have killed for that 12 months, we get, you know, before that, but that's, that's the whole thing that was sort of frustrating in, in some degree that we, you know, all of a sudden when the club was gone, the people wanted to put in. There was a lot of uh, corporate support, there was a lot of corporations in the western suburbs who had um, employees working for them uh, who basically their aspiration and their hopes and their happiness or their level of happiness rose and fall on the back of how the football club was doing. Peter Gordon and his team have successfully tapped into that classic us against them western suburbs mindset. The target of this driving animosity is a man who symbolises the enemy, VFL chief Ross Oakley. It had to be an us versus them, it had to be uh, it had to be those guys in their ivory tower versus us working class people. That was the only way they were going to really bring their support base together. I, uh, and they did a great job. It was a high stakes game and it was being played at a PR level. I'm relieved and I'm pleased and I'm proud that we never did things like print his address because, you know, there were some rather extreme elements in my camp that had it and wanted to. I think um, the Up Yours Oakley one, or Merge Oakley and Oakley, one of them was the creation of uh, Peter Gordon's wife. Uh, and it just took off. In fact, so much so that uh, Ross Oakley's son, Greg, actually had one of the stickers on his, the, back of his, uh, the back of his car. Ross is, a, is an intriguing bloke. I mean, he has got a great resilience and a great capacity to live with, uh, with the trauma that was going on around him. And I had guards on my home for 12 weeks. Uh, the guards removed someone from the property late at night, 12 o'clock at night. Uh, our kids had to be escorted to school. Um, so it was, that was tough going for a period of time and uh, uh, I don't think uh, one should have to put up with that sort of uh, behaviour but that's the passion of the game. And, you know, I take a lot of the credit for saving the Footscray Footy Club because they raised most of that from selling up yours Oakley car bumper stickers. With victory in sight, all that remains is to secure some all-important corporate support. With unions threatening to black ban all VFL projects if Footscray disappears, the Victorian government announces that the Road Traffic Authority's $162,000 Bulldog sponsorship will continue if the doggies survive. The icing on the fight back cake is the procurement of ICI as the club's new major sponsor. ICI, uh, I think, were the first company that sponsored, not because they wanted Footscray supporters to buy their products, but because they wanted to get some uh, recognition uh, that they were a member of the community and a, a good community citizen. The ICI deal is announced on Monday, October 24, the same day that the new Footscray board unveils their interim plans for 1990 at VFL House. The Bulldogs have $1.15 million in their fightback account, as well as new sponsors and a new business plan to carry them forward into the new decade. The war is over. The Footscray Football Club and those who love it have defied the odds and won. Well, I'd like to know that we're debt free. Um, we've got a strong trading position for next year. We've got a good team with the best young players in the league and uh, look out for Footscray in the 1990s. It's very hard to describe a moment like that. It's, it's the, the word that, that comes to mind is a sense of anti-climax. You know, I was 32 years old. I'd been a partner at Slater and Gordon literally for 10 days. I'd never run a business. You know, frankly had very little idea of what was in front of me. So, um, you, know, I had a, a, you know, I was all mixed with a sense of trepidation and uncertainty. I don't remember, or Peter phoned me and said, we've got it, we've done it. And it was just one of those things we just sat there in shock. We can probably equate it to a, a premiership victory in a way. I, I mean, I've never seen one. And in some ways that merger victory was a, a victory for the people and for the club. It was such a proud moment that day to see all those people there. But when they said we've made it, oh, that, that was absolutely unbelievable because, you know, you knew then your club was there. Get emotional. <laughs> and that's what this fight back campaign truly represents. 
While winning and losing will always be important, the true supporter's love of his or her football club is more about belonging. Footscray's remarkable victory is viewed by many as a turning point in the history of our game, a significant crossroads for the masses. Told to roll over and accept financial reality, they've chosen to stand up and fight to keep their dream alive. The league may well run football, but the people own it. While the Bulldogs have earned their stay of execution in 1989, they're far from out of the woods. There'll be plenty more battles to come. Dreams don't come cheap, and they certainly don't come easy. But here's to dreaming a little longer. Thanks for your company for this edition of Headliners. Join us again next time we flick through the pages of football history, right here on Fox Footy. Sometimes the little guy does get up and, and you know, David does beat Goliath. Doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. It's too tough to die. That's what they were, too tough to die. For all of the, the battle, for all of the struggles, for all of the difficulties and the lack of money and the lack of infrastructure and the bad luck, it survived. And that's the soul of the Fitzgerald Football Club.